Kinney. My name is Nell Mills. I work for Big Society Capital. I'm the Senior Director for Social Sector Engagement. That is the longest um, title I've ever had in any job that I've ever done. Um, so what that essentially means is I'm responsible for talking to social enterprises and charities along with my team. Um, there are um, two things that we often refer to. Um, I think the key thing that we do is translation. So um, as I said, I'm, I'm not an investment professional. I ran a social enterprise myself five years before I worked for Big Society Capital. Um, and um, there's an awful lot of complex language and jargon that comes around taking over 600 million pounds worth of dormant bank account money, which is how the social investment marketplace got started, and trying to make that something relevant <clears throat> to an organisation based in Suffolk or Norfolk. So Let's Talk Good Finance is our um, informal format about trying to bring this world, these two worlds close together. So what I would say is there are no stupid questions. If you're sitting there thinking something, there is bound to be somebody else on this call thinking the same thing. In terms of jargon, um, there's a lot um, of jargon. I think there is actually in the social enterprise and the charity sector generally. When I first came here, people constantly talked in letters that I didn't understand. Um, but um, do call us out if the stuff that we're talking about that we're not explaining properly. Um, do ask us. One of the pieces of research um, that we found out is that um, organisations in the social sector don't want us to dumb down the information, but they do want us to explain what they mean. Um, my standard line that I often use is that when I first came to the sector, um, people were constantly talking about things like mezzanine finance, and as an ex-retailer, I tended to think that was just like another floor upstairs. So um, yeah, you know, when we start talking about um, whether it's um, secured loans or things like crowdfunding, if you want more information, please do feel free to ask us. Um, Otherwise than that, um, we're going to go through the agenda. We've got two here from a peer speakers today, Rebecca and Adrian. Um, they're always, um, uh, no pressure guys, but always the best bit um, about um, uh, Let's Talk Good Finance, hearing the, the real stories from people who've taken on social investment. Um, and then we are also gonna provide, because it's quite a big group today, some breakout sessions where we're going to use another uh, little piece of um, tech, but you don't have to particularly worry about that because we're gonna do the, um, describing where we can have some um, slightly uh, less formal, smaller conversation. I think we're going to start off um, with welcoming introductions from Voluntary Norfolk uh, Community Action Suffolk. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's, it's great to be here today and to be hosting um, this workshop with um, Community Action Suffolk. Um, I think the fact that we've got such a great turnout for the workshop illustrates just how important um, social investment is. Um, so just a little bit of information about Voluntary Norfolk and Community Action Suffolk. So we're sort of well-established infrastructure organisations in um, Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, and our role really is to enable and support the voluntary sector to be as resilient um, and impactful as it can be really. So um, there's a, a number of services that we provide to um, enable that. Um, we've been working with Big Society Capital for a bit over a year now, um, certainly in, in Norfolk, to start to think about um, how to workshop like this to the county. Um, and my sense is that um, the pandemic, sort of the recent challenges that um, COVID has brought to the sector has really just pushed social finance right up the agenda. So um, my sense is that um, social investment is a really important way to sort of build the resilience of your organisation, but also bring in some additional um, finance to help with innovation. And I think, you know, we've seen a really innovative response from the sector in response to COVID. And I think now is sort of is it is the right time to be thinking about whether social investment is for you. I think historically social investment has been um, quite low in Norfolk. I think Suffolk has a slightly higher take up and um, Community Action Suffolk have got some really good resources on their website. So I would really encourage you to take a look at that. But um, I mean, I don't want to say a lot. I mean, this is really an opportunity for big society capital um, to um, share some of their wisdom with you but I also think a, a great opportunity to hear from some of our peers so a really big thank you to Rebecca at your own place and to Adrian at, at the walled garden um, 
community cafe and shop. I think hearing directly from people locally who've taken on social investment is probably one of the best ways to learn about it. So um, that's it. I'm not going to say anything more. Um, we really hope you enjoy the event. Really keen to hear your feedback and what any sort of further follow up you might want. So thanks for coming along today and I hope, I hope you have a really good time. Lovely, thank you Lucy, that's great. Um, we're going to kick off by the very first thing by um, using a little bit of tech called Mentimeter. I don't know whether any of you have seen that, but essentially um, it's um, a uh, interactive survey. Um, in terms of um, how you do this, um, in the chat, um, Ramjit has just posted a link, so you can either click copy and paste the link into a browser, go straight to it, or you can open um, a Google browser, put in menti.com and then use the code that's at the top of your screen now, which is 932282. And what we're asking you to do is to type in, why did you decide to attend today's Let's Talk Good Finance event? And this is where we're just keen to get some insight from you on why finding out more about social investment um, was of interest to you today. I always find this really useful um, just so that we can make sure that um, during uh, this event, we can make sure that we try and give you tailor the information to your needs. I think I've sat through a fair amount of um, events when it's a fairly standard process. So um, yeah, this is definitely in order to try and help us out. And um, I'm just gonna um, let me have access to this afterwards so I can make sure um, Uh, there's definitely some themes in there that I can see. Um, there's the, the peer learning. So um, hearing from Adrian and Rebecca, um, one of the primary reasons that we uh, run Let's Talk Good Finance, um, so that you get a chance to hear from social enterprise charities, voluntary and community sector organisations who've actually done it. So um, we often call it the warts and all journey. So um, you get the real um, uh, inside track rather than I suppose um, a glossy version from the people whose jobs that it is. So um, I was sharing with some of the early attendees that um, a lady in Nottingham told me that she'd come to a Let's Talk to find out to tell her, find out what these social investors wouldn't tell her. I think that's a lot about um, peer learning. Um, there's quite a lot about education, um, Joe, just learning more, um, whether it's some quite specific questions about um, the sources of investment and the products types. Um, but there's also um, organisations that are thinking more about their sustainability. And there's also quite a lot of organisations who are thinking um, on um, uh, supporting other organisations. So whether it's about um, from a local authority perspective or from an infrastructure perspective or about what's happening in your geography. Make sure as well that we share all this information with you afterwards so you could have a look um, at the questions that were asked and the reasons that people are here. Um, I will endeavour in both the roundup and the individual breakout groups to cover some of these. This is the other little piece of benchmarking that we'd love to do with you. Um, it's um, uh, called a strength checker. So we used to do this with a good old fashioned bit of paper um, or, or slightly more high tech with a QR code. But again, we're going to use Menti today as the quickest way to do it. So again, you'll just um, go to menti.com and it's a different code this time. It's 969797. What we're actually asking you to do is to rate um, just for you individually. And I have to say this will only come up as a cumulative for the whole group. It won't come up as for you individually. Rate at this moment in time what you think your knowledge of social investment is. So one represents no knowledge at all. And we have plenty of people that come to Let's Talk Good Finance with very um, little knowledge because that's why they're here. And then we will have some people have considerably more knowledge. And um, it's really for us to try and understand as a group, what's our starting point today? Put that, um, 
quite at half the responses yet. There's 38 people in the participants, so I think there's a few of us not, so probably need to get up to about 25. Okay, we've got a really good representation, um, and I think that's just to give us all an understanding that um, at the moment, um, as, a, as a collective group, our understanding of social investment is sort of about four. So, um, and that means there's lots of people here that are exploring this for the first time, and that is good. Because um, actually, if we've got lots of people who are up in the eights and nines, um, I probably feel a bit um, a bit concerned. Maybe we're not going to be um, able to give them enough detail because I'm, I'm certainly not uh, an investment um, professional. So um, yeah, average score four point one, so just about four. Right, lovely. So we'll we'll remember that and come back to that um, at the end. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ashita, and she's going to talk you through a little bit about good finance, telling you what it is and why hopefully that might be a resource you can use in the future. Yes, I'm hoping everyone can see good finance on their screens. Can you give me a nod if you can see it? Yeah. Perfect, wonderful. Um, so what I thought I'd do is just tell you a little bit more about um, Good Finance uh, is website. Um, and then uh, one, of the, one of the joys of being able to do this on Zoom is that I don't just have to talk about it, I, I can show it uh, to everyone. Um, so Good Finance is, uh, is a collaborative project that's supported by Big Society Capital and Access um, and a whole range of stakeholders and supporters. Um, but we are a user-led project and our mission is to help charities and social enterprises navigate the world of social investment um, and everything that we do and build and create is for charities and social enterprises um, and we do that directly by working with our users. Um, so there are a couple of tools on the website uh, which you might find uh, useful. So I thought I would just kind of uh, show you some of these tools, um, especially if after today you've had some food for thought, you've had some conversations and, and you start thinking, well, actually, could, could this be a viable option for me? Um, good Finance is a really good place to go to, to figure that out. Um, so one of the key tools uh, on, on the website is um, our diagnostic tool. Um, so this is a very simple uh, two to three minute tool. You go through it, it will ask you a couple of questions um, around uh, the, the location, uh, the legal form of your organization, but also what you potentially might be um, needing the money for if you have an idea of where income might come to pay it back. Um, and you go through this diagnostic tool and what it will do at the end, it will tell you if social investment could be right for you, um, but also what type of social investment might be right for you. Um, and it will give you a bit more information on that type of social investment. Um, because um, I'm sure one of the things that will come out today is that, is that there are lots of different types and um, they can be used for different organizations under different circumstances. Um, so this diagnostic tool uh, is a really good place to start. Um, if you don't think, okay, that's great, but I want to see how other organizations have use it, used it, what you can do is go to our story section and we've got lots and lots of case studies uh, on, on here. And you can again search these case studies sort of by location and the amount, um, but also the, the financial products. So when you go through the diagnostic tool, it will tell you which of these products could be right for you. Uh, and then you can search um, our case studies uh, using those. Um, so this is a really good place to go to if you just want to hear more about how other organizations have used social investment um, and it's in a range of formats so there's a couple of podcasts there's a couple of written case studies there's some videos and um, so however you like to learn and um, hopefully there's something in there for you um another key part of our um of our um website is our social investment advisors and fund directory um, so this is a very comprehensive list of uh, every social investor in the uk uh, where they're based what they invest in and um, what kind of social issues and what kind of product types they have so again what you can do is search this so for example if i search uk wide um looking for 50 to 000, uh let's Oh, sorry, um, let's search this UK wide 50 to 100,000. Uh, I'd like to find out about the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, event emergency finance options, uh, secured loans, and maybe some unsecured loans as well. And if I go here and say, okay, these are the social issues I'm working on education, employment, family, and friend relationships, what you can then do is filter results and what you can 
there is all of the investors uh, in the UK that might be investing into what, what you're essentially looking for. You can also do the same for funds. Um, and what you'll find is when you click into an investor, it will tell you what types of funds they have and what types of products they offer. Um, so this is the investor directory. So if, you, if, you're, if you're really thinking about, you know, which investors should I be talking to? Who are they? Where are they? Where do I find them? Um, this is a really good place to go to. Um, something else that we have is we've got quite a lot of tools on measuring social impact for social investment. Um, one thing, again, that I'm sure will come out today is that social investors, uh, unlike, unlike commercial investors, are interested in both the social return and the, and the financial return. And um, so it's really important to be able to communicate um, your social purpose um, and your social impact with them. So we've got a couple of tools uh, on here, a quick video that you can watch. Um, and also the, um, uh, we've got a tool called the Outcomes Matrix where you can sort of personalize uh, your outcomes uh, on here. Um, two other quick bits of the website that I will show you is um, on, on the later section, you know, we've got all of our blogs and events thing, and things are on there. One bit that might be helpful at the moment is our COVID-19 uh, resource hub for charities and social enterprises. Um, so we've been working to collect um, as many relevant and helpful resources that we can find um, to kind of support charities and social enterprises navigating through the crisis at the moment. Um, and finally, we've got a whole host of learning tools on the resources. Um, so that's a very sort of quick uh, thing that we have uh, got on the website. Um, there is a, a sort of two minute video, explain a video on here as well about what social investment is. And um, if you kind of, if you want to go, go, go watch that. Um, but yeah, lots and lots of tools and resources. Most important thing to know is that everything that is on this website is built and designed for charities um, and social enterprises. Um, that's kind of it from, from me, I think. Was there any questions or Mel, did you want me to play the video? Yeah, I was. I was thinking that playing the video would be a really good two minutes just okay. um, in introduction. Great. So if we can just do that. Yeah, let me just get the video loaded. Um, I'm just going to uh, get hold on. Across the UK, charities and social enterprises like yours are tackling some of society's biggest problems. Maybe you've set up a coffee business to give people the skills to get back into work, or are running a nursery and using the profits to support local parents. Whatever your mission, you'll need money to help with cash flow, to grow your organisation, or to buy an asset like a new building. You might even need finance to kickstart your new venture. And that money could come from traditional grants or donations, or as a loan from your local bank. One option is to get that money from a social investor. That social investor could be an organisation or an individual, and you can borrow their money or offer them shares in your organisation. But what makes a social investor different? Well, they don't just want to see a return on their investment. They want to see their money being used for good, helping you to keep delivering your social mission. Sound good? To see if it's right for you, check out goodfinance.org.uk. Thank you so much, Sheila. Thank you for that. So yeah, if there's anything else you want to find out or watch more videos and things, there's lots, lots more up on the uh, Good Finance website and Mel's popped in lots of the links in the chat. Um, but um, also do drop me a note with any, any questions if you've got them. Lovely, thank you. So um, we are going to um, move over to um, just shortly hearing from Rebecca and Adrian um, in terms of uh, their journey. So um, I thought I would just um, say that Good Finance is always available to you. It's a, a free and accessible resource. We continue to add and build new things. Um, it was the main route um, for us to come together 
with lots of organisations out of the sector who believed that there was a, a place to try and um, uh, simplify and make more accessible um, social investment. Um, some of the stories that are on there will range from really small organisations taking on just maybe you know £10,000 uh, repayable finance to very large organisations that will be taking on multiple millions in terms of really scaling their impact. Because I think that there probably were, um, certainly when I joined Big Society Capital five years ago, you know, social investment, unless you wanted to borrow quite a large amount of money, potentially to buy a building or something we would call asset backed, so that usually means when you're buying bricks and mortar or something else, um, was more of the norm and it was quite difficult to borrow quite small amounts of money. Um, and I know there's quite a few of you here that are startups or perhaps smaller organisations. Just um, so that you know, the average um, amount of investment that a social enterprise or charity wants and for its first time is only around £50,000. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a huge amount. And it's also really interesting. I think um, Adrian's going to talk through some of this that it doesn't always have to all be um, social investment as well. Often you can get packages of support with different pieces and social investment can often be the, the completing part. Um, it's also really important that um, if uh, you're very early start or you haven't yet established trading, you may well have to think about um, your enterprising activity um, before um, you actually can think about taking social investment on. But social investment is a sort of overarching term for lots of different products and ways that you might, might um, raise money. So um, if, we, uh, if, if there are things you hear today and you think, oh, that was really good, I remember, I want to hear a bit more about it, we will be um, with Adrian and Rebecca's permission producing some podcasts so that we have to share their stories later on. And we have around about another 30 odd um, organisations who've shared their social investment journeys. So um, if you like listening to podcasts or reading stories, you can find those on Good Finance. Um, with no further ado, um, I'm going to hand over and um, I think Rebecca's going to go first and she's going to tell us about your own place, um, CIC and what their investment journey has been like for socialists and to social investment. Been like for socialists and to social investment. Good morning. Great to see so many people here this morning and, and interested in this. Um, and I'm um, particular uh, group that I am a bit of a fan of is here, Mini Donks. So if you don't follow them on Instagram already, your life is about to get richer. So do check out my book's very own mini donks. Um, little plug there. So I'm Rebecca and I'm from your own place and we're a, a social enterprise in Norfolk. And I suppose really the, the first thing I want to say and, and endlessly reiterate is this is just our experience. Um, this is what works for us and for me and came about as a result of a, I guess, a unique set of circumstances. Um, so it's by no means advice as to what would work for you. We are a community interest company based in Norwich. We started in 2013 and we exist to prevent homelessness. Um, and we do that in a whole range of ways from training people in life skills, tenancy and independent living skills, to providing mentoring for people moving into their first home, um, employment support, and a lot of that has unsurprisingly recently turned into a very exciting and innovative digital offer. So we've worked across Norfolk and Suffolk and done a little bit of work in Cambridgeshire to date, but as a social enterprise, we go wherever the, the mission and the finance stacks up. So that's us really. So, in terms of social investment, um, these things are a chance, or people say, aren't you lucky? Um, in the last seven years, I feel I've made quite a lot of that luck, really just by being an opportunist and, and saying yes to a whole lot of stuff and meeting a whole lot of amazing people. Um, so I had considered social investment uh, before. I had had a few conversations with Big Issue Invest, about smaller amounts of money. Um, and I'd also spoken to the, the Clarion Orbit Community Impact Partnership. Um, none of those terms really suited us. We're a micro enterprise. I'm probably quite risk averse. And the, the repayment terms just, just didn't feel right for us. 
at the time, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that. So last February, February 2019, I was on an accelerator program about the private rented sector with the Young Foundation. Um, and Chris West, who co-founded Sumerian Partners, um, was there. And he came to talk about social investment. And I think I'd probably parked it at that point. So that was really when it started. That's, that's February last year. So that's a, it's a year and a half ago. A little bit more about your own place. Um, we are a CIC and we have a huge diversity of income from a small amount of donations, that's not what we're relying on, to restricted funded income, to uh, traded income on which we make a very, very modest profit. So for us, it was really about finding the right investor for us. So. There he was, Chris West. Um, I liked him, you know, you, I, I think if I were giving tips, that would be my tip. Um, we just got on. I just thought, gosh, he's a sympathetic guy. I'd like to chat to him some more anyway. Um, he'd been head of the Shell Foundation and just really seemed to get our world. So on the back of uh, meeting him, I sent him an email, said, look, you said I could get in touch. Well, guess what? I'm getting in touch. And I went down to their offices in Blackfriars and started a conversation and really what worked for us is it's a partnership we respect them as much as they respect us we are equals and they just got our sector they realized that we couldn't pay it back in a couple of years which had really been the terms of everything else i'd looked at they realized that we work in social impact and it takes time and it doesn't have high profit margins so we needed an investor that would be patient that would be understanding and flexible. Um, and he and, and Amy, who, who is our sort of contract manager, just seem to get that in spades, that what we do is hard, what we do will change, and no one's getting rich off the back of it. And they certainly, that was not their motivation. So a bit about process, there's Cara, our outgoing um, chair on our board of directors. So inevitably, um, Amy and Chris wanted to come up and meet our board. That was all part of their due diligence. And it wasn't tick boxy or lots of forms. They came up to Norwich from London. We had a lovely lunch together um, and they chatted and wanted to get a sense of kind of who, who was behind the scenes and the questions they had and, and were they up for it really. So that was really important. Um, and, and Cara there you'll see is a lawyer. Um, and I obviously can't stress enough how useful that was when the paperwork started coming through. Um, and of course, they came and met the team as well. There's Simone, one of our team. And, you know, they, they found that what I was saying about the team and about the organisation was real, was true. They came and met us in person and, and got a sense of who we are. So that was very much part of the due diligence. So, as I said, we're a small CIC. So the negotiations and conversations rumbled on. Um, they only have three investees. We are the third. So they weren't in any hurry. They're not sitting on pots of gold. They have to secure it their end and secure the cash so that that comes to us. Um, so we have a profit share agreement with them. So essentially we repay to the tune of 20% uh, of any profit we make over a certain amount. Um, and that's it in a nutshell. It's a loan. Um, and the, the purpose behind the funding, um, we've borrowed £100,000, which to a micro-enterprise and to somebody who is an anti-borrower seems a formidable amount of money, but that's, that's what we've borrowed, um, is to hire an operational manager, um, who I'm thrilled to say it's her first day and she's in the Zoom, so welcome Jess. And the uh, idea behind that is to free me up to make the business sustainable. So, that was meant to happen seven months ago, but you'll be aware that a global pandemic has got in the way of our, our recruitment plans. And I'll talk a bit more about that. But yeah, we, we will make repayments through our traded profit, a 20% profit share will be going back to them as payment. I'm not gonna show that one. These were biscuits um, that are, it's just an example really. Our investor sent us some uh, bespoke cookies for the team. Uh, to welcome the team back from furlough on 1st of July and to welcome Jess too. 
and really it's just an example of the relationship we have with them it's sort of not top down we're not doffing our caps to them we're not telling them we're terribly grateful all the time we're equals and we respect each other as such so moving on about the social impact absolutely fundamental that was the other bit of the due diligence they want to know we make a difference they want to know how we measure we make a difference and that is absolutely as important if not more important um, than the money we pay back i mean that's absolutely the truth um the money is there we do we do owe it we have borrowed a hundred thousand pounds as i said over 10 year period so that really was the other very marked difference with other borrowing. They know that those are the kinds of time frames you talk about when you're talking about making a profit. Um, originally, we were going to start paying that back in June 2022. Uh, with COVID, we've negotiated a pushback on that for another year. Um, and the amount we pay back is also capped. They have no other stake in our business, but just as an ongoing working relationship, they do want to know about big changes. If I was going to leave or there are changes in the board or fundamental changes in the business model, um, we would absolutely discuss those with them. And in terms of social impact, we report to them or are about to start uh, reporting to them quarterly on a series of metrics, inputs, outputs and outcomes that we've agreed with them, as well as they get our monthly management accounts. Um, and so there they get everything frankly our board gets there are no secrets um, really about that at all so it's as much about the social return as it is about anything else and what it's done is enabled us to enter the next phase and there's the next phase um, a few of the people we've worked with but also Jess bottom left hand corner before she left us in December we've rehired the same person oh yes um, and she's now our operational manager and that's an incredibly exciting next step for us my awareness of, of social investment of the social enterprise sector is um, that we struggle to find the right infrastructure support for us. Um, and so we get stuck and so we don't scale. And we have to scale to survive because we simply cannot turn over the income that our structure requires um, as a micro enterprise. That's fine if you want to stay the size you are um, and be pushed to the limit. But, but we want to grow because we have an impact and it's our, our duty to have that impact um, further and greater. So that's what this um, will enable us to do rather than restricted income, which would just be another project and another stretch and strain on the team. Um, this in effect is unrestricted cash, albeit we've negotiated what we're going to spend it on and they were right behind that. So that's us. Hopefully that gives you a flavor of our journey um, and why we've done it. Lovely, thank you, Rebecca, that's great. Um, I've already done the follow mini donks. Thank you very much. So one more follower for them. And uh, thanks for sharing all those details. The, the slides that you've put up, um, if you're happy for us to share them, we'll make sure that um, those are made available. Um, it was really interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. It was really interesting. There were lots of things you said that I'm going to pick up on and come back um, on, because I think there's lots of things you shared that we often hear from um, our, hear from our peer speakers. Um, we are going to be taking questions from you at the end, so please feel free to start using the chat. But I'm going to hand straight over to Adrian because he's going to talk to us about a different experience. So um, what happens when social investment comes from a community purpose of trying to do something together and how, how can it support as part of a package of support? So, um, Adrian, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mel. Hello, everyone. I'm Adrian, chair of um, Plumstead Community Shop. Um, we're going to trade as uh, the community, uh, the Wall Garden Community Shop and Cafe. We've um, we've got three elements to our, our finance model: a partnership, grant funding, and and community shares. And just to give you some context, um, the Wall Garden it is literally a Victorian Wall Garden. It was part of um, a country estate. Um, of, of some acreage, probably 100 acres or more. Um, in the early 30s, Norfolk County Council um, bought the, the hall and, and the land and converted it into uh, a mental health um, hospital, would have been called an asylum um, back in those days. And gradually over time, um, I think in its peak, it had in excess of a thousand patients there and, and, and included a included sort of nurseries and, and laundries and, and a farm. It was a sort of completely self-sufficient. 
Um, then over the preceding years, as, as the numbers um, gradually dropped and, and with changing attitudes um, towards mental health, the, the land was um, eventually sold about 15 years ago um, for redevelopment. And um, since then, with approximately 420 houses have been built on that site. And in fact, the final phase of 15, which completes it, uh, planning application has, has just gone in for. So that's actually, in Little Plumstead itself, that's doubled the, the size of, of our village. The, the sole surviving part um, of that mental health hospital is Broadland Clinic. Um, they are still there on site and they have um, a 20 bed medium secure facility for men with learning disabilities and autism and the World Garden had for many many years been a, a significant part of of their of their therapy um, with their patients and on, on their on their recovery journeys and so that uh, that was lost when when the land um, was sold for development and the initial idea came from um, a social entrepreneur who you may know his name's Robert Ashton he had a chance conversation with a, a doctor at Broadland Clinic and sparked the seed of an idea of to try and get the wall garden back um, and to reconnect that with the clinic but to make it a much bigger idea that the community um, the local community themselves would get involved um, and raise funds to to, to build um, a community-owned shop and, and cafe within the wall garden and then to, to restore the wall garden. Um, and so that was the first part of our partnership element that um, because of the, the connection with Broadland Clinic, which um, are part of HPFT, they are the NHS um, mental health aspect who, who specialise in that area. And the, the possibilities for their, for their service users to, to come back into the wall garden and not only to be in the garden this time, but also to have um, real sort of life work experiences of working in the, in the shop and you know working the tills or serving and also the cafe itself um, that opens up a stream um, of NH funding that we were able to um, to tap into the the second part of uh, the partnership was with our parish council um, because of the uh, the development that's, that's going on in our in our village um, the developer was uh, agreed to pass back the walled garden. It's, it's called a section 106. Um, and that's where developers are um, actually obliged to give something back to communities. And the parish council um, agreed to take back the, the freehold of the walled garden. And, and then as their part of the partnership to invest the other part of what developers have to give back these days is called SIL money, Community Infrastructure Levy. Um, that's a, a percentage that builders, developers have to give back to the county councils and, the, and those amounts are then distributed out towards the areas where development is taking place. Or not, I believe actually anyone can apply for, for some of those pots. And so the Parish Council um, directed some of the money that they had been receiving for the developments into repairing the walls. Um, and making them safe um, after an engineer's report and survey. So they've invested um, probably in excess now of £100,000 um, to make those walls safe and also some of the, the outbuildings that were initially there and had been used by Port and Clink, they, they refurbished um, some of those. We also um, feel we're in partnership with the Plunkett Foundation. Uh, we joined those and them immediately. They've been helping community groups and uh, community shops in particular for over a hundred years um, and they were enormous help to us in, in the early days. Um, they, they helped us to um, incorporate as a community, a community benefit society, it's a type of CIC. Um, we are a not-for-profit and we're owned by our membership, our members, um, but the, the prime difference with a, a community benefit society is that we work for the benefit of our membership but the, but the community as a whole. Um, and not for profit, I'm often asked what that means. It doesn't mean we don't want to make a profit. Uh, we do want to make a profit, um, but the profits stay in the community. They'll stay in within the project of the wall garden. 
um, or if we have reached that point of time um, with other community projects that are going on in our village. Grant funding, um, we were very clear that that was the major direction we go to try and raise the funds for, for the new build itself. Um, and we made um, a whole host of grant applications um, and then sort of looking at the ones that we were successful for, it came to sort of a budget as to what we felt we'd actually be able to provide. We, we applied to people like the Prince's Trust, Sport England, the Tudor Trust, Big Lottery. Um, none of those we were actually successful with, but um, the major one that uh, we succeeded with was the um, Rural Development Programme for England, um, which is also known as the Leader Fund. That's actually European money, um, which um, you know available to help uh, rural areas uh, develop and also to to promote um, employment um, in rural areas. And um, we were able to secure a grant of, uh, from them of a hundred thousand pounds. Ironically, now we'll uh, be flying the European Union flag for the next five years. <laughs> We also, in the early days, um, applied for some seed funding. Um, our local county council had a, a small grant a fund of 500 pounds, which uh, we were awarded. And also Power to Change, um, another organization who are very helpful, and I'd recommend anyone um, contacting. We, we applied for their Bright Ideas grant, um, which was primarily aimed for, for startups in the early stages of, of um, of their business to help with the, we used it for things like um, architects fees, um, some of our initial um, promotional um, materials and also with our um, community share issue, which I'll, I'll talk to a bit later. So we, we, were, we were awarded a £15,000 grant to help us um, in those days. The CART Foundation um, have been very supportive um, of our project. Um, and we uh, secured a grant um, from them of uh, 10,000 pounds and also um, a, a interest-free loan um, over five years um, of 50,000 pounds and um, with a, with a one-year payment holiday on that so we don't actually have to start paying that back until um, later this year and again with COVID there, there's possibilities that we'll be able to, to delay that a little bit. Um, Pocket Parks, I'm talking about the successful grants that, that, uh, that we achieved. Pocket, Pro Pocket Parks was a, is a government, um, a government initiative to, to help um, local communities open up spaces. So the wall garden had been um, pretty much derelict for 15 years and nature had uh, started to take it back. So um, we applied for that one and uh, achieved a £15,000 grant from them. That's 10 minutes gone, so I'm, I'll speed up now. Um, yeah, I was just about to say, um, Adrian, I know there's so much because you've got a, a yeah. wide package of funding, but would you just, um, I know you've got a wide range of funding from lots of different sources, including local authority, parish council, some of the grants. Would you go on to talk a little bit about the community shares, just because I'm so conscious of time? Yeah, community shares. Um, we kept our community share issue um, tight within our community. Um, the Plunkett Foundation helped us to pull all that together and um, get it compliance. Um, and it was an opportunity for um, everyone to, to buy shares within the company. There's no financial dividends with our offer to, to people. Um, the, th there is an incentive from HMRC, um, if you're a taxpayer, with the SEIS community shares. There's a 50% tax refund that the government will give investors. Um, but within, within our own organisation, we haven't offered our investors any dividends, future dividends. It was very much angled as this is a social investment to, to try and help make the, the project work uh, and within the context of a, a big volunteer you know, operation and, and reconnecting with Broadland Clinic, it was a social investment rather than a financial investment. Um, and we raised um, £26,000 from our local community um, in doing that. And the final thing we did just recently was um, we had a crowdfund, camp uh, crowdfund campaign where Aviva invited us to join their platform and we crowdfunded for some solar panels and we uh, achieved just under £5,000 on, uh, on that crowdfund. I'll stop there. Lovely. 
Thank you, Adrian. That's great. I mean, I think what your example particularly does is it explains that um, there's a whole range of different funding um, that can go together to fit together. And in Adrian's case, some of it's repayable and some of it isn't. So, um, and it's always interesting, I think, when you talk about crowdfunding and community shares, because actually um, community shares are essentially social investment because you can, usually with conditions that are set out, um, trade your um, community share back to the organisation after a considerable, it depends on what the time scale is, but essentially it is an exchange of capital for a share. And whether you get interest or dividends again is set out by the particular organisation, in this case there isn't. But we do quite often find that very small amounts of repayable finance can also help to leverage larger amounts of graph, particularly with um, quite capital intensive or, or large um, projects. Um, and also um, what you're able to find is that there are different bits of finance, I suppose, that can be used to do different jobs. So um, I'm really um, conscious there are a couple of questions in the chat and I know that we've only got Rebecca for a few more minutes before we split out. So can I just um, open up the floor to Rebecca? There was a couple of questions that were asked um, around about um, what happens with patient capital where you've got cap in place? What happens if you don't get to that cap? What does, what does that do? Um, um, and how is that connected? Is, we often get questions around income and profit around this and how they relate. Um, yeah, so we have a sort of very simplistic way of looking at profit um, because we have so many different income streams, restricted income and unrestricted income, which is our traded income. So it's only that income on which we can make a profit. Um, and then, yes, it's a 20% profit share of any profit um, we make. If we don't, um, then we potentially renegotiate the terms, i.e. the length of the repayment. Um, um, or potentially it even gets um, wiped at the end of 10 years if we haven't repaid it. Extraordinary terms. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That's great. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, this type of capital in a minute. Um, has anybody got any questions for... Adrian or um, any for Rebecca. Um, we've got a few minutes before we break up and I just wondered if there were um, any questions. Anybody want to, you can either pop it in the chat or take yourself off mute if you want to ask it. No? Okay, I'm going to, I posted a couple of things as well. Um, best as perhaps you'd follow up and post the rest of the jargon buster twitter links in just because we're actually talking quite a lot here about things that you would refer to as patient capital or um, equity like capital quasi equity revenue participation these are all terms that um, are starting to be talked about more and more it's definitely a type of finance there isn't enough of um, in the sector um, so uh, there's some more information there before we break into the, the groups then, what I thought I would just do is do um, a little bit of reflection on some of the things that um, uh, Rebecca said um, and also Adrian said. So um, Rebecca said that, you know, um, she was quite risk averse. Well, actually, you're not on your own, Rebecca. You know, um, most social enterprises and charities are because, you know, after all, we care about the, the social impact we're going to create. and We don't want to do anything to put that um, at risk. And those of you that have trustee boards uh, may find that they're even more risk averse. I sit on a couple of um, uh, trustee boards. So um, you, you may also have to think about how you work with your um, trustees. Um, you said something that really hit home with me, Rebecca, and I was going to share this actually in my reflections at the end, but I thought I would do it now, which is you said that, you know, you, you just got on with Chris, you know, you liked him. Do you know, that's, that's not unusual. Um, we say that, um, Social investors invest as much in people as they do in organisations, and you are going to do the same thing. When you take repayable finance for an investor, this is not a relationship. It's not like going to the bank, all right, you get the yes, no, and that's it, you've got the money, and only issues whether you repay. This is going to be, a, for you, a 10-year relationship. For many people, the minimum is going to be is a three- to five-year relationship. So it's really important that you find a social investor that shares your values and can offer you the right type of product. So our advice that we hear from other here from peers all around the country is not all investors do the same thing. In fact, Rebecca laid that out quite well for you. Different people have different products and they will be more or less appropriate to what you're doing. Also, the cost of those products um, 
will vary depending on how much risk the investor is taking, how long they're lending it to you over. Um, and I always remember there's um, a social enterprise in Birmingham. It's actually taken on social investment a couple of times now. But um, in the first instance, I remember that uh, the entrepreneur said to me that they had to kiss an awful lot of social investment frogs before they found their social investment prince. Um, I think what they really meant was just that they found their crisp. <laughs> so what they found was the right investor um, for them to work with. The, the brilliant thing now that um, Good Finance can illustrate to you is that you, we all have more choice. You know, four or five years ago, there was much less choice in terms of the types of social investment products or the types of investors that there are out there, which you can just see by the amount of people listed on the investment directory. So shopping around is important, but also really important. And I think, again, Adrian and Rebecca have really um, exemplified this is you have to find what the right type of product um, as social um, entrepreneurs, people who care about impact, um, voluntary community sector leaders. Um, we often just want to get to the Z as quickly as possible. So I have to say, we, we start at A and we want to get to Z, which is we just want to get on and do more of the stuff that we're here for. Um, and what we sometimes don't take enough time to do is to do the, the middle letters of the alphabet, which is about working out which are the right investors. So what's the right product and then what are the right investors? Um, and social investment is this term that covers everything from community chairs to crowdfunding, to um, a revenue participation loan, which is um, the sort of thing that Rebecca's talking about, to something like um, a social impact bond, which is a um, government or a local authority based um, outcomes contract. Um, and then the most usual type of investment is unsecured loans. Um, generally, that's where we don't have an asset, so it's not like a mortgage effectively. So there's a whole range um, of those things. I also really liked your. Um, comment about the balance of power, Rebecca. Um, and I think Adrian again um, covered this in terms of the fact that um, often when people are doing social investment for the first time, they feel a bit outsmarted or a bit, you know, not quite in control. And um, I would encourage you to um, find that confidence because taking social investment is really important to your um, organization. So I, you know, we want to make sure that organizations, opportunities like this one, and good finance and peer examples and shopping around allow you to have that confidence in the same they would if you were taking on a contract. Um, and again, um, although Adrian's um, war garden is quite finished, I know they're in construction final stages now and I am hoping one day to get there in person. Um, what that does do is show you, show you that this sort of mixed um, range of income streams, um, including donations and grants along with traded income, around being sure who your customer is and how that's going to get repaid are all essential things. Because actually we can't get away from the fact that social investment is repayable finance. It needs to be repaid, usually with interest, not always because um, not all community shares, um, as Adrian's explained, have those um, integral, but usually with interest. Has anybody got any other questions that you want to pose to Rebecca before she runs off to go and recruit some hopefully great new uh, non-exec directors. I think Adrian's hanging around with us for a little while. I mean, if anybody does think of anything later, perhaps you can always pop it in the chat and if I can't answer it for you on Rebecca's behalf and the things she said, I'll, we can always check back in afterwards if that's okay with you, Rebecca, and feed that back. Okay, so we're going to move on um, into some breakout groups. Um, and uh, essentially, thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, we really appreciate you being with us. Thank you very much. It was an inspiring story and we'll definitely follow up um, more, more detail. Um, what we're going to do now is to break out in, uh, into these little groups. Um, you're going to have some facilitators with you. The way that this will work is you will get a little um, box that will appear on your screen that will invite you to a breakout room. All you need to do is accept it and you will find yourself squirreled off into a little group with a facilitator. And the screen that you can see at the moment are going to be the sorts of things that we are going to be um, talking about. So, um, Banjit, will you do the honours? Invite people into the groups. It would be great. Lovely. I'll see you in breakout group one. Um, is there any um, reflections from the group? Um, it would just be just to hear a couple of sentences. Mine would be that um, we had some good peer sharing. Um, so organisations working around animal-based um, charities. 
Um, and we also had um, quite a few people that were very new. Um, and so I think there are quite a lot of resources on good finance um, and also some specific links to case studies that will be really useful. So that's one of the things I'm going to take away as a, a follow up in my group. Amelia, was there anything you wanted to add? No, I don't think so. No. Lovely, thank you. Could you just pop over to one of the other groups. Just want to give them a quick heads up. Um, I could just feed back from group two. Um, I think quite a lot of the conversation was just about the real importance of finding the right investor, finding a like-minded investor, and certainly what we'd picked up from both, both of the um, presentations was you, you have to have a lot of conversations, or it seems like you have to have a lot of conversations before you can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, find the right the right investor. And and the other point that was raised was about the real importance of, of getting your your trustees or your board members on board early on and, and kind of and we heard about you know that there are resources that are made available specifically for um, to be used with trustees and boards which I think would be helpful. Super that's brilliant thank you very much and then and I'm actually going to post the link um, to those resources so we um, actually have some free resources called Get Informed Social Investment for Boards um, and it features 17 different um, faces of our campaign. In fact, um, Tina, interestingly, Lisa Hilder is one of those as well, the lady that I was talking about. Um, and so there are some free short films. If your board are thinking about this, I would highly recommend sharing them. I've had several thousand views um, and you can share them at any time. Again, they're, they're all free and there is some additional support for trustees in there. You just go to the third group. I'm just gonna do some feedback from there. I've lost track of who was in which groups. Yeah, that was uh, our group. Okay, so Give a couple of other lines to Sarah as well for me to add. Uh, so we looked at the process of social investment and one thing that sort of came up for me was the idea that uh, social investment can also help to not become grant dependent um, and making sure that there's a huge reliance currently on income in terms of contracts and um things that may not necessarily be profitable um so finding new ways to sort of grow that and also looking at everyone's really on an early stage sort of um landscape in terms of social investment so how can they use social investment along with grants together to benefit their organization okay Lovely. i just very much. sorry just yes, to quickly Sarah. add that um also to echoing what claire was saying with the previous group that there was a lot around getting your trustees on board and sort of breaking down those cultural barriers that there are traditionally is to repayable finance was also quite an important area. Yeah, I think that's, that's good, right, Sarah. Two, two of the things that the trustees that we recruited for Get Informed said, one of them said, you're slightly selling your beneficiaries short if you at least don't understand as a trustee board what social investment could do for your organisation. If you go on then to, do, to say it's not right for you, that's the responsibility that the trustee board should have. And then um, Lisa Hilda's story, which I think is really interesting. So we were talking about um, Preston Road Women's Centre is, you know, uh, their first experience, the first time is they lost half their trustee board because half of the trustee board, we were talking about risk averseness, just were not prepared to take on debt. What I would say is um, after a very turbulent period, they've now taken on their 10th um, type of social investment they've grown to scale massively and they deal in supporting women and children families that have experienced domestic violence um, and um, also really interesting is that their learning um, from an organization based in Hull is actually influencing a new fund that will be announced um, and that will be nationally available so you know essentially we've learned from them it's not the investors saying how that this fund should work it's been an organization who delivers I'm saying actually that funding's not right for us. It needs to look like this. Still repayable with interest, but you know that, that's the that's that's the feature. So yeah, I'd highly recommend if you've got trustee boards, have a really good look around, get informed, um, which I've posted the link into there. And um, I, uh, for voluntary action Norfolk um, on community, so voluntary Norfolk community action Suffolk, um, and also Alex for Navca. You know, we're always happy to do more stuff around support for trustees um, if that's helpful. We've done some trustees-based events as well. Okay, 
So I think um, we're coming back just to um, round up now um, in terms of um, final pieces. I've got three minutes, I think. So um, should we very quickly move to Mentimeter, um, Ranjit, for um, the final screen? So what we're going to ask you to do now is go to the final uh, Menti. Do you want to post the code in there as well, Ranjit, if you can, the, the code? Yeah, so um, if you go to menti.com, and then we'll give you the um, the, the, the uh, three code, which is um, 6143.55. typing it in for you thank you those that were able um, to get in and what we're just asking you to do is say after this hour and a half um we're not expecting you to um uh have become um sort of fully qualified to become an investment manager in an hour and a half if you're doing well you've done um better than me but um if you feel um that your knowledge has improved um by attending let's talk good finance um compared to the beginning of the event to the end of the event, where do you think your knowledge is? And I think it's interesting for us to see as a group um, how far we travel, but also for our personal perspective, how much more we've got to learn. And that's where um, good finance um, is always available. Um, and of course, we repeat um, these Let's Talk Good Finance all around the country. So whilst it's important to do these from a geographical perspective, if, for instance, you think, actually, I'd really like to listen to somebody who's taken on social investment, maybe for community energy, or actually, I'd like to listen to another um, at like a community shop, or I would like to look at somebody who's actually um, uh, taken the investment to buy a small holding, for instance, um, or somebody who's taken an investment to buy property for a well-being centre for domestic violence, or for any of the topics we've discovered today, there will probably be a podcast or a case study um, that we can point you to. So at the beginning of today, uh, we thought as a group, our combined um, knowledge or understanding of social investment was 4.1. And at the end of today, it's 6.7. So actually not bad for an hour and a half that we've traveled um, a good distance to finding out a little bit more. Um, I think it's probably fair to say your knowledge is, is never gonna be complete. Um, in the five years that I've been here, I feel like I'm learning all of the time. I'm learning from my colleagues who know about investment speciality. I'm also learning all of the time from the social enterprises, the charities and the voluntary community sector organisations that I speak to daily now or see on Zoom or used to see all around the country. Um, essentially, it's about me taking the information in and trying to influence the next set of products to make sure that they can do the job. Um, I suppose I would leave you with the thought that um, I often get asked, is it worth it? Is taking on repayable finance debt um, worth it? And so the question, the answer that would say is, first of all, only you can answer that, you and your trustee board or you and your non-exec directors, directors, but also the fact that if the impact that you would create by taking on that loan is worth it and you can afford to repay it, then it's definitely something that we should know more about and consider. In the chat, the other thing that we didn't share was the seven lessons learnt, which is often um, the things that um, social enterprises and charities tell us. Actually, Rebecca and Adrian between them um, covered quite a lot. Um, so things like um, uh, it's about more than money. It's just not about lending. Um, it is about finding the right partner. It's about being really honest because things don't go according to plan. If you want to find out more about those seven lessons learnt, they're just the seven key headlines and I know that Again, Ranjit, pop those in the chat. So um, after this, we will be following up, um, sharing the Mentimeter, sending all of the links um, that we found, the Jamboards, which will populate with a little bit more information of which you will be able to see both your own group and the other group. Um, it's been fantastic um, having so many of you here, um, just showing that there is an appetite, even in difficult circumstances, to know about all of the tools that you can have in your toolbox. And of course, we'll share the recording um, as well. So um, you'll we'll have our contact details. Um, thank you very much to uh, Voluntary Norfolk and to Community Action Suffolk for partnering with us to put this on. And I'm just going to leave it to see whether um, either um, Lucy or, or uh, Claire or um, anybody else would like to um, put any parting words in. Yeah, well, just to say thank you to everyone for attending. Thanks to Big Society Capital. I think that's been a really, really informative event. I've certainly learned an awful lot. Um, a huge thank you to our um, peers. Um, I think, you know, it, it's, 
it's fabulous to hear about the breadth of products that are available. And I think that's probably one of the takeaways for me, the fact that there is some really quite flexible products out there. So it's really worth doing that homework to find out what is going to be the right thing for you. And I think also, you know, to access some of that business support that comes with that sort of investment, that's a real, a real asset for the sector. So thank you very much, um, Mel and team. Um, yeah, fabulous. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you very much too. Uh, Ramjit's done a lot of the hard work behind the scenes. She's quiet, so not as noisy as me, but she's definitely kept us on track and kept everything working. Mostly the tech went according to plan, which is always good. And, um, you know, had a really good turnout for this. And um, thanks to Ajita and to uh, Festus for facil facilitating and for all of the rest of the support. And um, it's been fantastic um, to see and meet so many of you. Um, and you know where to find us if you need more help. Thank you very much.